Well, on top of a number of other things, the, the, the shocking news of the day was, was uh, losing an incredible fellow musician. And we, all of us on this stage can tell you. You know, that guy loved music so damn much. He could never stopped playing, never stopped writing, never stopped recording, never stopped creating. He was, he was dripping with songs. They, they'd go into the shower after he took a shower and there'd be three songs laying there, just in the gray water. But, um, and of course I'm talking about Prince. And if there was anyone that I would have thought would still be playing when she was, when he was, you know, 80 or 85, it was going to be him. So today's a real, real shock. And um, you know, people know him for some of the ways he looked, or the different ways he looked, or the different things he said, or the different, you know, a lot of, a lot of incredible things to remember him by. But I gotta tell you, as, as musicians, and you know, you just saw some great guitar playing. Prince was probably the greatest guitar player that we've ever seen. It was amazing. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett! Fucking camera in the truck. everybody now welcome to live on four legs a definitive live pearl jam podcast and as we go along the next couple weeks we are going to see more and more of dark matter we're going to see songs that might be released as the next single and more and more ideas of what they could be doing on tour and right now as we speak the last couple of days they have been revealing the tickets and a lot of you know what shows that you're going to which is phenomenal but as we always do here, we have to look back at history a little bit because if we didn't have the history, we wouldn't have any way to have gotten to Dark Matter. So that's why we're going today. If you remember last week, Atlanta 2012 was the show, and that was, of course, John's experiences. And in back to back weeks here, you're getting another John experience show here, Columbia 2016. We've done a lot of 2016 shows, and we're almost near the end of them, but we kept this one around for a while, and John, again, is going to have some story for you guys. There are two big themes about this show. The night before was supposed to be the Raleigh show, and of course, we know what happened with that. It got canceled, has not been rescheduled to date. And then, on this day, earlier in the day, we found out that Prince had died. And those two themes weigh heavily on this show a little bit. So good to get the first-hand experience. So why don't we do that right now? Randy Sobel over here, John Farrar over there. Hello, hello. Hey, what about this show? Yeah, this one, I think, gets overshadowed. Obviously, Greenville being just a few days prior gets all the accolades, and rightly so, for being the Versus show. And then week after this, they do the two shows in Philly where you get 10, and that's obviously a huge deal. But I think this is one of those sleeper ones. That every time I go back to it, every time I think about it, I have really good memories. And there's a couple of moments here that really stick out to me. 
going back and like watching the video brought back a lot of good memories and yeah this is this is a sleeper one for me i have good memories like i i had done jacksonville and greenville before and you know they were spaced out enough that i did jacksonville and then went home for a couple of days did greenville went home for a couple of days and i had tickets for raleigh luckily i hadn't driven up there or anything but my plan was to do raleigh then drive to columbia hang out that day and then drive back home because like i had I had one ga for all the shows come to you know find out i think that was it the day before just maybe just two days before that they weren't going to play the raleigh show was canceled and i was bummed out i mean i was on the side of like fuck it go play like go play and, and say what you have to say but i think it was that springsteen had canceled yes. one of his shows there and i think that was a big influence on them on their decision probably didn't feel right doing that after he had canceled his and i remember there you know there being a big statement and all oh, you know we did as best we could and i think he mentions it here that i think he says something like oh people might say we waited till the last minute waited too long but we tried to do everything we could and like maybe that fell a little flat like what did you think was going to happen i mean obviously the state legislature there wasn't going to change their mind because of a pearl jam show i I, at the time, I'm, I think still I was on the side of just go there and play and cause a stir, but they ended up not doing that. And yeah, like I said, it hasn't been made up since. I tend to think that they've forgotten about this, honestly. I don't think they even remember that it was canceled and they promised they would come back. You know, it's really hard. I mean, they set a weird precedent here where they said with this cancellation that they were going to stand up for human rights. And after this, and the shows and the places, it's not like they don't play any red states. They went down to Texas last year. They did four shows in Texas. And two shows in a very, very conservative Fort Worth. You can't go down to Texas and not have that in your mind, like what they're doing with immigration and with the abortion laws that have been terrible I think they just realized after this that it didn't really make that much of a dent. Unfortunately, you know, you want to change the world and you think that you have it all in your hands for you and being a big band that can make that area some money and that state some money, like you think that that could be a big deal, but they'll just find something else. They'll just find something else. It's a hit for you know, a couple months or whatever, but they'll find money other ways. Yeah. If you set a precedent for something like that, then it comes off as weird when you do go to other places and things look worse. And I, I granted at this time period, this was pre Trump and the world wasn't really that awful yet. It was not great. And we were seeing what the world could be with Trump in office. And I think now maybe the idea is that there's just too many fucking things going on and we can't say no to everyone. But then I think with something like this, that a couple places were doing this, but maybe they felt like this is the time that they had a voice. However, they played a couple shows in Florida. They played four shows in Florida and you know how fucked up Florida is. Oh yeah. And they did repeal the law a couple of years later, the bathroom law that we're talking about in, in North Carolina is not in effect anymore, although I'm sure they're doing their best to bring it back. So yeah, I mean, if they had been following it, I mean, they could have had the big moment to do the triumphant return. Like, hey, we're back, we're here, we made it, but it hasn't happened yet. You find out about the cancellation, you stay home, and then you wait another day to go up to Columbia. Yeah. yeah. And you're it's in a short GA. drive. It's only like three hours. Okay. That's, that's not terrible at all. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in GA. What's the reaction yeah. from people from that? Are people still talking about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, people were upset because I think the general thought was, like I said, like, yeah, fuck it, go play. Like, you go play and you say what you have to say and you make a big deal out of it and you make them acknowledge it. And yeah, you cause stir up some shit. Like, yeah, go play. So, yeah, that's not the only thing that happens on this day. I mean, this is a whirlwind news day. Usually one of these yeah, things yeah. takes over a show. But I remember where I was. When I found out I was producing a show called the Rosillo and Canell show. It was a God awful show. And I hated just about everyone that worked on it. 
And I was in my control room and all of a sudden, I guess it was a graphics operator or maybe my camera operator. He just says, oh shit, Prince died. And your first thought is like, I thought he was immortal. Like he never, and Ed kind of says it here. He says something along the lines of, you would think that he would be playing well into his eighties. And he was just one of those kind of people that, it felt like he would never die. It felt like he would outlive cockroaches almost because he was just that big of a presence. And it was really shocking because I think in January that year, we lost David Bowie. Mm -hmm. So that's two mega stars from rock and roll, like absolute game changers, innovators that we lose within four months of each other. And you want to get into the, like the next year and losses. You, have, you lose Scott Weiland, you lose Chris Cornell, you lose Chester Bennington. You, I'm sure I'm missing some people here and there. Oh, Tom there, Petty. There was, there was a run of a year or two where it was, they were dropping like flies. Oh yeah. Horrible, horrible. And it's not like a couple musicians here and there that you might know. It's no, these were all chart toppers and possible hall of famers, if not shoe and hall of famers. Yeah. I remember, so like we in the getting in the GA line and obviously, you know, people are familiar the GA line just moves to the merch line when the merch shows up, everybody kinda goes, Okay, I'm behind you and then you go move over. We're in the merch line and it's probably, I don't know, twelve thirty, one o'clock maybe, getting ready to open. And I'm looking at my phone, I was looking at Twitter, and I see something. People around me are just kinda like doing the usual thing. And then I see it like, Oh yeah, Prince is reported dead. I'm like, Oh shit. So I like kind of tapped the person by me like are you seeing this like did you see this like prince prince died everybody's like what I'm like are you serious so everybody like 100 people immediately pull out their phones and then you get start getting the alerts right they start getting the news alerts like and everybody kind of just goes oh shit like immediately there's like a pall cast over the day's events and everybody's like oh shit and you know i remember too you know so you go on and we, we get our merch and it's kind of ironic like the poster for this show has a little bit of purple in it and then I remember, like, when you line up to go into the venue, uh, I remember a girl came around, and she had, like, a huge stack of paper, and it was these purple sheets of paper. And she was handing out one to everybody. She goes, here, take one. We're going we're gonna to hold these up. It's for prints. We're going we're gonna to hold them up. So everybody had a little purple sheet of paper, like a little half sheet. So we all went into the venue kind of holding this little purple sheet of paper, like... I don't remember if she said like during the encore or whatever, but I think it was like, oh, if they meant when they mention it, make sure you hold up the purple piece of paper. So it kind of had that going. And then, but yeah, I remember like there was like a weird energy in the building as we were kind of waiting because you know, you get in the building at, at 5 30, 6 o'clock, and then you got to wait two, three hours for them to go. So you're just kind of waiting around, talking to people. It was a different energy than a lot of the other GAs that I've been in. That's rather incredible that somebody had the thought to do that right away, yeah. like instantly, yeah. and be like, yeah. let's go to CVS and buy as many purple papers. Right. And I mean, like, how many sh did they give out? Like, oh, it was it was a huge hundreds? stack. I think everybody in GA had one from what I remember. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's super impressive to yeah. do that. So, again, you can't stress it enough and Ed will talk about it so much that he seemed like somebody that was just so larger than life that it didn't yeah, it seem like he was going to be, he was going to be 25 forever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He was only 57, which is just yeah. nuts. The story is he was running himself and like he had two recording studios going 24 hours a day. He would just pop in in and out, like lay something down, like put down some brilliant piece of music or write some incredible song and then leave. But he was, yeah, evidently like using substances to keep that going basically nonstop. And that catches up with you at some point. Yep. And I think that's exactly the same way that Tom Petty passed away as well. Mm -hmm. I think it was an accidental fentanyl mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. overdose, which is just sad. Well, look, Outside of all that, you guys do get a good show. There is definitely some overcast of everything that is happening, but the band at times will dig into that and focus on that. But at other times they'll say, all right, let's have some fun. Let's have a good time. Let's have a rock and roll show. 
And the way that they're going to start it here, they're going to open up with Oceans. anyone saying oceans i never never would have guessed oceans for this night but yeah fantastic i mean i think they come out and the vibe is very good mac just kills it on oceans every time as soon as stone starts playing that riff you're just like oh my god like you're just transported back and it's it's a perfect opener and it gets in it gets out you just have to kind of enjoy it while it's happening yeah this person of oceans i don't want to say concern me but i definitely kind of perked my ear a little bit at this because there were things that ed was holding back on a little bit he wasn't pressing his vocals on any of the courses he was going really low baritone on those and like okay if this is down tune first of all and then he's doing that on this that means maybe he doesn't quite have his full fastball and this is the kind of show in the place where it is and how many shows that they have done to that point where ed can have some wear and tear on him. I was going to listen for that in the show and see how that progressed and developed over time. And it was a tougher show for him. I think he got through it. I think it was okay, but it was a more difficult show for him than usual. There are a lot of times where he just sits out for a lyric or so and then comes back in just to take a breath or it's part of, he doesn't think he can hit it, whatever it is, but it wasn't a great A Ed show on this night, but Hey, you know what? It's Pearl Jam, and Pearl Jam is exciting for just about everybody, no matter what. So, <laughs> And yeah, 2016 was kind of the year that that stuff started popping up a little more frequently. And to in the show, I think there's really just the one little section of kind of the faster, more quote-unquote punk rock songs, fast rock songs. And then they lay off those for the whole rest of the night. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You're going to follow up in this opening three with Low Light and Small Town. It is interesting because some of these 2016 shows just start in right away. Open with Corduroy, open with Mm Go, Why Go, and they're off to the races right away. But I I wonder adding that in is also another effect of Ed saying, guys, got to ease into this one. And maybe it was another way of saying hey the mood is a little bit like you know we just lost prince we don't want to go out there and have a big show-stopping opener like let's ease into this one a little bit and then let's toss it around when it comes to later but low light and small town are going to follow up on that what'd you think of those following up i thought anthemic feel on small town and really kind of felt the passion from that and low light was very good too very jangly from stone I mean, Oceans into Low Light is a super cool beginning. After that, you're like, oh, man, you know, it's one of those things like this is completely unexpected. Like, what are we going to get tonight? And then Small Town again, you know, I talked about it last week. You know, you want to show what you can do as a crowd uh, and be as loud as you can. And this building was full. It was it was a good crowd. And you can hear that early on, too. There's a couple of moments where he'll kind of like feel it out a little bit. There's a moment in Lightning Bolt where you kind of like, OK, see what we got here. But Small Town's great. And then. It kind of has the feeling of like one of the 2022, 2023 seated sets. Like they kind of come out like, okay, we're going to take it easy and and then kick in. But a little hint of what would be to come a few years later. So before he goes into the next section where we're going to start getting some good rockers, Ed just screams out, Columbia. And then we get the count to go into Animal. It's going to be Animal, Mind Your Manners, and Evolution. That count into Animal almost sounded like it was Even Flow's count. And it didn't sound like the cleanest intro into that. And maybe that 
tossed up or something like that, but it didn't sound like Animals Count. Yeah, I had seen Animal a, a few times, and I don't remember this one sticking to me for whatever reason. Yeah, I think this is, like I said, the only really kind of fast, really upbeat ones that they go for on the evening Animal and Mind Your Manners here. But yeah, I don't remember this really sticking with me. It's more of some of the later stuff that they really hit more, so maybe it took them a while to warm up to. Yeah, I noticed that this was more dedicated to the pocket groove in this instead of like absolute scorcher. And it sounds fine, but I think you go back to like how things would sound this year. They would take more of a methodical approach with Animal this year in the last year where it doesn't have to be an all out scorcher. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. And they pick their moments for it. But this one, it felt like, okay, a little bit of the ease in from the first three kind of setting the tone and building up to the moment. But it really felt like evolution was the moment where it was like, that's it. It's all out there. Let's go. Let's party. Let's get on with the show. Definitely, definitely. I think Stone, too, I remember on Duty of the Chain, because I was kind of in between Head and Stone, kind of on that side. I remember just like, oh, we're going to get a good Stone one tonight, and he did great on Duty of the Chain. Yeah, I loved Jeff in this mix here. I thought he sounded just terrific and very vibrant, and Ed's subtle lyric changes to This Feels Like Church, and also... <laughs> I'm not going to hold him against this. It's it's not fair to, but we talked a lot about the yips, and he even admits in this, I fucked up again, but clearly having a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed this version just kind of being the first breakout moment from the show. It says, good evening. Nice place you got here. Thanks for inviting us. Now, you guys know this is a college town. I think we've covered Columbia 2008 before, yeah. and you can't go to this place and not mention something and not make well, you saw those hats everywhere. Thousands of jokes about it. So here goes nice and cozy, like home of the Cox. What does that mean? I know what it means. It means that all these guys down here have huge, uh, thumbs, thumbs up, cocks up. I feel like we just played Columbia that we played Bogota, Columbia. This is different. This is Columbia, South Carolina. We made it. This one is to the home of the Gamecocks. And as Evolution kind of set a little bit of the fire under them, the momentum definitely transfers over for Lightning Bolt, Given a Fly, Immortality. This is a really, really good section. Lightning Bolt is very, very interesting. And Ed, in the beginning, he's asking, help me. I'm almost feeling it. Help me feel it. Help me feel it. He's trying to get that energy from the crowd, and it builds up. It keeps building up, and you can hear the crowd going for it in this. This show and its showstoppers are going to be the story for me. And it starts with Lightning Bolt. A lot of these songs have that, like, classic arena rock refusal to end the song like let's just keep going another chord another chord Cameron just pounding away pounding away pounding away doing something incredibly crazy and sounding like they don't want the song to end it happens on maybe like six or seven songs in this set and lightning bolt is where that kicks off and it is yeah I, I love it you know say what you want about like the big arena anthem kind of thing, but I think it added to this show. time i had seen it and the other ones were not this good 
Yeah, Lightning Bolt absolutely stands out from the show. I love that. Obviously, when you're in the crowd and he says that, like, oh, help me feel it. Come on, then you're going to give a little bit extra. And then he does the, you know, towards South Carolina, which gets everybody going. But I thought this version had some tension, like it had some push and pull to it. Like it felt like they were really locked in on it. And Cameron, especially, has a fantastic show overall. But this is one of the highlights from two others. Great on the ending, especially. And there's a moment where... Ed kind of goes over and plays guitar back to back with Mike and I, of course, like, oh, that's the moment, like, pull out my phone, like, I gotta get a picture of this. I had a little kind of photo book made of this little run of shows that I did, and I think I used that image maybe as the cover to have to pull that out and look, but I remember getting a really good picture of Ed and Mike back to back playing guitar right there. You could really tell that they were really pushing it on Lightning Bowl. This is probably one of the best versions I've heard. It is really good. And what's interesting about these three all together is that all three of these are soaring songs, but soaring songs in such a different fashion. Lightning Bolt has that like kind of twinkle soar to it where it feels like it is going into the night sky. Given a fly, it has that ascended soar where it feels like it's triumphant and feels like you've accomplished something, you've made it somewhere. And then Immortality, it has the thunderous soaring power that just comes down and and hits so so hard it's kind of crazy they usually spread these out a little bit sometimes but i love the soaring trio and even before getting into given fly i want to mention this it has a funny little call and response moment with the crowd and then he kind of does this little muffled response at the end like and everybody kind of has a laugh at that that was pretty funny but after lightning bolt you get a good give it a fly and you get an all world version of immortality yeah i love this section and i think that that little call and response that's him feeling out the crowd like okay what am i working with tonight like what can i go for what can i give this crowd and yeah kind of just test him a little bit and you can see he's got that look on his face like all right show me what you got and it went great and i mean given to fly as much as immortality is fantastic you know given to fly was kind of my song at the time like my son we just adopted he was only about not even two months old at the time so this song i think i talked about a lot when we did the greenville episode like took on a huge new meaning for me being a new dad at the time like this was my number one song I'm getting here like especially after that lightning bolt just like i remember just getting a little emotional just wanted to like scream as loud as i could along with with every word but yeah just fantastic but i mean yeah you can't bury the lead here i mean the immortality i put this version of immortality up against anything hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the best immortalities of the lightning bolt and on era that I've ever heard. And I want to talk about the intro here just for a sec, because everything else is pretty important and pretty amazing as you would think, but they do the little arpeggiated intro. I've talked about this before. It's one of my favorite things. It's probably what lured me into my absolute love and obsession with the song. And a couple weeks ago, there was this, you know, on Twitter, sometimes there's this like one or two day trend thing where people use a meme and they explain it in some fashion. And there was a meme from the show Hot Wings. I don't remember if the show's called Hot Wings or Hot Ones. It's, Hot it's, Ones. Yeah, it is Hot Ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They bring on a celebrity and they eat chicken wings. And as they progress into questions, the sauce gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And I don't know who this woman is. She's an attractive blonde woman. She's very pretty. And the picture on the meme is her like looking up to the sky with like bright blue eyes with like the happiest smile on her face. So people were doing memes that were like, you know, how I feel when my quarterback throws four touchdowns in a game, or something like that, like reflecting your most positive feelings. So I was like, okay, what do I do to make one for Pearl Jam? And I thought some here and there, I'm like, what makes me happiest to hear in a Pearl Jam song? And the one that I chose was when you go from the arpeggiated intro into that do 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 I that's I can do that and I can still get a little bit of goosebumps in my mind just singing it like that. That might be one of my favorite moments in Pearl Jam. Period. Yeah, it's I mean it's such a jarring thing because you go from this really pretty kind of major key soft intro and then when it switches it goes into that stark kind of minor key 
emotional riff that comes in that it's just a complete 180 and it kind of turns your heart over a little bit like oh man it's that rush you get like oh here we go and yeah it's one of the coolest things they do period but yeah i mean just an insane version i mean i love kind of the delay echo that mike is doing the jam is just hypnotic like you hear what jeff is doing just driving that thing completely the build that they do before the solo is just absolutely perfect you have to go back to like 95 that fall of 95 to hear versions where they were building it up like this and then when cameron comes in at the end and just drives it home it's just like it's the catharsis that you've been waiting for for six minutes right i wish this version had gone on for 20 minutes no doubt it could have absolutely and mike's doing like an electric staccato like right when cameron is starting to really pound away and really start to get at it and you can hear that and it's ongoing it's ongoing it keeps going it keeps running and you just don't know when they're going to end this again it's the second song here where it's the never ending ending and i think with this song obviously you kind of know that a jam is coming and everything like that but you're on the edge of your seat every time like all right how far can they go how far they can they go and when you think okay this is the cutoff point. No, this is the cutoff point. And they just keep going and going and going. That's something, that's an intangible. It's definitely one of the best things that Pearl Jam can do. have to mention here too i kind of brought it up before when talking about prince you know he felt immortal and i wonder if that went into the mindset of choosing this tonight oh yeah i, I would venture to say that the set list was probably adjusted or pat took that into account for sure i think there's going to be a few performances tonight i mean the next song is one of them too that i think took on a little bit of a different meaning because of what happened with prince yeah, I can see that. And what I want to tie into Evenflow a little bit is that a handful of years ago, I had stumbled across a clip of Prince playing Evenflow live. And I went and I found it. It's rather incredible. Mm-hmm. And Prince seems like the kind of person that, like, to your face wouldn't tell you how impressed with you he is. It kind of seems like he would hold things pretty close to the vest. But when he does something like that and he sees a song and he's like, you know what? That's a damn good song. I'm going to make it my own. I'm going to cover it the way that I want to do it. Then that's a sign of respect from artist to artist right there. It doesn't have to be said, but I'm sure that got passed around through the band. I'm sure that they were more than thrilled to hear that and know that their song is being done by what Ed says is one of the best guitarists on the planet. All right, what about the solo? You said that it kind of matched a little bit of what might be the sorrow of losing a peer in music. Yes, the Evenflow solo, I think Mike is still using some kind of weird effects there. It seems it seemed a little darker going back and listening to it than it normally is. It didn't have the kind of like explosive kind of joy that Evenflow solos sometimes take on. This one felt a little, I won't say restrained, because it's just different in that way, but felt like it was a little funereal, like a little mournful. Yeah, I heard a little bit of that. I definitely heard a little bit of that. I heard also sometimes, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes he pulls off like that lawnmower pole, like that vacuum cleaner lawnmower sound. And uh, Javier was telling me, POG organ mode, 
plus MXR phase 90 and high speed setting to imitate the Univibe and pulling and pushing the tremolo arm. I know all this stuff, guys. <laughs> I do. Trust me. It's crucial. <laughs> crucial for my opinion. Yeah, for sure. And he'll be on in a minute or two to talk about something that's incredible. So you'll not want to pause the podcast for that. But we do get a Matt Solo in this, too. Two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row that it's not in the prime Matt Soloing era, era, so that's pretty impressive. I wonder if that was him wanting to do a little something on the song, too, like talking about it before. Like, guys, I'm sure he has free reign to do it whenever he wants to, but I'm sure he was probably like, guys, give me a moment on this one. I want to let some stuff out of thinking about Prince as well. And that's where we get to another conversation here and another Ed paying his legit tribute to Prince. And he says, we appreciate energy tonight because on top of other things, the shocking news of the day was losing an incredible musician. And all of us on the stage can tell you that that guy loved music so damn much. He never stopped writing, never stopped recording, never stopped playing, never stopped creating. And he was dripping with songs. He'd go into the shower, come out, and there would be three songs just laying there. All of us were incredibly fortunate to get to see him a couple of times. Some of us even got to meet him. He was an intense cat. If there was anyone that I thought would still be playing when he was 80 to 85 years old, it would be him. So today was a real shock. People know him for maybe the way that he looked or things that he said. There's a lot of incredible things to remember him by. But I got to tell you that his musicianship you saw some great guitar playing. He was the most amazing guitar player that you've ever seen. He will be missed. And that gets you into Light Years. I'm going to package it together with Marker in the Sand here. Light Years is the pick, of course. Anytime that somebody in the industry dies, it's usually Light Years come back, one of the two that they pay tribute to. However, the next couple of songs in here not ones that they play very often. And it felt like from the beginning and a little bit when you get into the song as well, they just did not seem to gel like you usually think they should. The intro to Light Years was very, very strange. Something was off to the fact that maybe I thought, were they trying to like actually play part of a Prince song to get into that? And it just kind of backfired. It didn't sound like it, but it was totally different. It didn't have that little sparkle that Light Years usually has. And then Marker in the Sand, you're waiting for a crunchy riff. You love that. You want that to get in right away like that. And it's very effect heavy from Mike. I don't remember the last time that I heard Marker in the Sand kind of sound like that. And, you know, they hadn't played it since 2014, so it had been a while, but something felt a little off. Well, I remember, I mean, the, this is, you know, when he's talking about Prince, that's when we're holding up the purple sheets of paper and everything. Oh, like, for sure. Yep. Yeah. So hundreds of those things. You can see a little bit in the video. Hundreds of those things go up on the floor. Yeah, I think the intro to Light Years is cool. I think he probably just was a little overcome, like a little just trying to make it perfect and trying to do something cool. Yeah, I mean, it's a little awful different different sounding but i think it's cool i remember like it just felt like just watching he's got his head down he's like totally into it it felt like he was trying to bring prince back by playing the guitar as hard as he could you know it felt like he wanted to put all of his emotion and feeling into it and that doesn't bother me if it's going to be a little off a little imperfect it's fine i thought light years is great he was really into marker as well like i said there's a weird kind of vibe in the air but ed was really into marker as well like emoting and running all over and getting into the ending so a couple of deep deeper cuts here before you get to the hits to end the main set and that would be the last time that they would play marker in the sand before playing it in chicago that right. amazing incredible version that i will always hold dear 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 to my heart before getting into infallible you know it's interesting it's really interesting next week we're going to do brooklyn 2013 And there are so many parallels from this show to a show that happened three years before that, that it's so weird. We'll get to it when we get into the encore as well. But Infallible at that show was dedicated to his daughter's 
I think he said something along the lines of for their future. And that's essentially what he's talking about here. And that's the idea of the song. But it's just interesting that they kind of have the same sort of tie in. And that leads to Ed saying, not all songs can be about sex, drugs, rock and roll. There are other issues that can also get you horny, like for the smart guys and the women and the geniuses and the scientists. They like songs about weather patterns and unethical corporations ruining our planet so we won't be able to survive on it in 50 years. Ruining the lives of our great-grandchildren. Seattle has had incredible weather for the last two years. It's like Malibu up in West Seattle. And I hear that down here it's getting a bit soggy, like we traded weather patterns. Talk to your congresspeople and make sure they're paying attention to what's happening in the sky. If they tell you that it's not true, look into their background and consider the source. There are a lot of people like me that would like to keep Seattle this way. It's great right now, but it'll be great for another 40 years and then we'll all be dead. And this would just become another bootleg in the collection. I'm warning you, but let's all sing about it anyway. That'll get you... A bunch of songs at the end here. Infallible, Jeremy, and then I Got Shit and River Mirror a little bit later. Infallible, we're going to get to Javier in a sec. One of the things that I wanted to do with Javier this week that he was excited to do was just songs that he hasn't covered on the show before. And we're going to get into Infallible, even though that this is not anywhere close to a great sounding version of Infallible. It gets off in the wrong key and boom is on the wrong key for half the time. And that little, dun, 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 they are completely off on the first part of it. And it just kind of spelled disaster for the rest of the song. Having that like first minute or so have a little bit of the key errors in there, but yeah, not the best version of the album that I've seen. And maybe not surprising then that this is the last version to date. Is it um, really? Yeah. They have not brought it back since the show. <laughs> which is which is a bummer because I mean, at the time, I mean, this is my favorite song off the of Lightning Bolt. Like I was stoked to hear this. Yeah, you know, we'll give it. You know, Mike has some cool backups on it, doing some oohs and ahs. But yeah, I mean, you could tell. Uh, I remember like there was a little bit of like, hmm, something's not right here. But I still love the song at the time. I was still singing. Let's go to Javier, and he's going to talk about kind of how this song sounds because it's interesting. It's an interesting live song because you get that little thing that Stone's doing in the beginning that kind of sets the the tempo for the song and sets the identity that the song has. And it's an interesting song musically, so let's hear what he has to say on it. Hey Randy, hey John, hey everyone on the podcast. So we're covering Columbia 2016, and this week we're going to talk about a song that we usually don't talk about, which is Infallible. This song has a pretty cool thing. Okay, so go with me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Matt and Mike, they follow that rhythm pattern over the whole part of the song. Basically, Mike follows whatever Cameron is doing to create this cascade progression over the song. Note aside, boom, completely, completely missed the entry mark here. I think he was thinking that they were playing the song in the original key, which starts, is in the key of A minor. But in this case, yeah, you can kind of hear it. (laughs) It falls apart very, very dramatically bad throughout the song. But the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four that these players they follow to, it creates this sense of urgency, especially in the first part of the song, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, in a stone, just doing the first bars on each four. So it's one, four, one, four. This pretty cool combination creates this cascade feeling, creates this kind of like staccato playing rhythm that you have over the whole song. Guitar selection for this kind of tune, I've seen it all over the place. Sometimes they both go strats, sometimes they both go Les Pauls, sometimes Mike will go strat or Les Paul and 
Stone will go vice versa. Lately, I think they kind of nailed it where Stone will stay with Les Paul or something that is going to have more like that humbucker sound. Pun intended for what's coming next on this episode. But yeah, that's what I can tell you when it comes to the guitar selection for this song. But yeah, we wanted to take things different this week because sometimes, like I know, effects, amps, all the stuff that I like to talk about. But sometimes we forget that creating different tones or sounds it might come from the rhythm the music pattern the beat pattern that you're choosing to play so that's something that we wanted to address this week hope you like this comment and i'll see you guys in a little bit all right albeit not the most pristine version of infallible though it'll, the last to date javier can make it sound like gold so thank you to him and that's that's weird too like it seems like it would have been perfect at the Gikitan era fits right in with the themes like felt like they would have busted it out of this once yeah I was just thinking that to myself would they ever do this again and probably yeah I think they have one or two more times especially if the theme is brought up but I think we do go yeah. back to it we get a very standard Jeremy after that I'm sure the crowd was very very good on that oh insane insane like this was the loudest of the night. And I think this version has some teeth to it as well. Like it's got some tension, got some push and pull. Like it was loud in that building. I'm eager to go. Now I got shit though. Cause we haven't talked about it in forever. That's exactly. You took yep. the words right out of my mouth. Yep. I was so fired up to talk about this and it kind of has a renewed energy in my mind now. Not that it doesn't have a good energy already, but like this one especially made an impact. And very, very emphatic on the, I got memories, I got shit. Who the fuck am I ever going to get a mask? Like, oh, just a fun version. And then again, this is another version where they don't want to end the song. They're just bringing that heavy presence, that percussion ape shit style to the end. And honestly, there's a little part, that first little chord ring out, and then sometimes they don't like go into that power ending they just kind of end it with one chord like that boom, and they end it pretty easily of course i'm gonna favor the hard stuff everybody is but it sounded like for a second that they got to that point where it's like will they won't they will they won't they and they wait just an extra second and boom they pulverize the shit out of that ending of a song here like lightning bolt and immortality that we talked about before just great a shit oh yeah like the who in 1965 like i fully expected firecrackers to go off in the drum set like it's the big rock ending but yeah i got shit here i remember being a complete surprise like did not expect to get this especially late in the set like this and again one of my favorite songs like maybe in my top five pearl jam songs so absolutely stoked to hear it all that energy comes back especially after big jeremy with everyone into it yeah i got shit's a total highlight i remember just screaming along to every word that ending did you know that stone didn't even participate in that hmm. just standing around like looking at everybody <laughs> yeah you guys have have your little fun do you do your little rock show <laughs> i'll be i'll be here ready when when we're ready for the next one this is, this is now a two guitar song, you guys, because I, I don't invest myself with shit. Right, right. Rear View Mirror is going to end this set, and that's going to be another damn clinic from Cameron. It's kind of acknowledging, like, everybody clapping. He's like, hey, it's harder than you think. And it's just, 
absolutely killer version on this. And I know he changed his lyric to took a drive tomorrow. That's interesting. I was like, yeah, okay. Right. Where were they off to next? Yeah, I've never heard him do that before. New Orleans was next, and then Lexington? Yep, New Orleans. So that's probably a 12-hour drive from Columbia to New Orleans. That's a day. Yep. But again, this is going to be an absolutely killer moment. Everybody oh. in on this and invested, and it's just one of those powerful, powerful bridges where it feels like it can basically drill a hole through the earth. And a long forgive, forget section two, which is awesome. Death, I thought, was just outstanding on that bridge. All these runs on the base were fantastic. And they brought the lights up as well, so that gets everybody going. Just, yeah, stellar version of River Mary here. Court time. Let's pause for station identification and talk a little bit about Patreon. Obviously, you guys know that there is an album, Menator, coming out, which is amazing. And that just means that Live on Four Legs is the place to be when it comes to all the information on tour, on album, on brand new singles, on everything. And we could really use right now all the donations as humanly possible for Patreon, you guys, because it's going to help out. As I mentioned last week, we have a lot of business expenses to get to in the next month or two. So we can really use some help to power through that and have a little bit of expenses for the tour upcoming in May going into Seattle. So any help is really appreciated. And I think for the people that are going to donate to the horizon like tier, which is $10 a month. We're going to have something special for you guys in the not so distant future. Hang on to that. I know I've been talking about that for a long time, but it feels like it's coming into fruition rather soon. Yeah, it is just so helpful at this moment. And I can't say enough good things and great things about the people that have donated for as long as they have, because it really has impacted what we do. And again, mentioned every week because we got to, but all of the shows are going to have instant reaction episodes and will all be available on Patreon. And that's going to be the thing that I hope drives everybody there. And I hope that you guys are enjoying because a lot of people are following up. It's like, Hey, a post game show for like a football game or a baseball game or something like that you want to get the idea and you want to get the highlights and stuff especially if you weren't able to watch a live stream there's going to be west coast shows where people on the east coast not going to be awake during and they're going to wake up the next morning they're going to want to know what happened and that's why we're going to be there we're going to be there we're going to get you all of that in a timely fashion and a lot of help will come from our people on site Again, if you want to be part of that, please, please, please reach out. There's a lot of places that we're not going to be that maybe I don't have a lot of friends that are going to be in some places. I will have some in some areas, but all help is absolutely appreciated. Europe, Australia, a lot of people from Australia have already reached out. I really, really appreciate that. And you guys will definitely hear from me at some point and we can use all that help. But East Coast too, Wrigley. Indiana, Missoula, all of these places, whatever you guys can do to help after the show to talk about what happened in the show and kind of do a little bit, get a couple people around and, and just get the conversation going and we'll ask you questions and we'll ask what your favorite performances were and stuff like that. 
it's just a lot of fun and it really, really helps out and kind of gives us an idea of what we just saw that night and put it into perspective. So that's all things that happen on Patreon. And hey, if you haven't joined Patreon before, here's something that you can do. If you go to patreon.com slash live before legs right now, just do it without any agenda or any idea in mind of what you want to do. Just go and look. Just go and look at what's there. Go and look at and see what kind of episodes that we have. And maybe something will perk your interest with an evolution episode or a late night series episode. Or we have tons of episodes from the past that you can go through. Bird School, tons of stuff to listen to. Even some 1991 and 1992 shows that are full shows that we haven't done on the main platform that are available for you guys. So take advantage of all of it. And if that is enough to lure you over there, if you are interested in the content, you just keep saying to yourself, I listen to a lot of live on four legs, but gee, how can I listen to more of that? That's your way. Patreon.com slash live on four legs or download the Patreon app and search for live on four legs or you can go to live on four legs.com, the hub of the concertpedia, which John is getting his pen ready to take his notes and get to all of the reviews and recaps after the show because that'll be out every morning as well after shows. I'm clicking and my pen right now. You got to get exercise in there. This is spring training for your pen. Exactly. Click away. Can't wait. Can't wait. What's your 40 time with your pen? Oh, very, very good. Very good. Olympic quality. Mm. Mm. I don't know if I trust that. I don't know if I like very good. Needs to be. Hey, we're just getting the training started. By the time it runs around, we'll be in peak shape. All right. I mean, I'm counting on you. I'm counting on this all working out. If you want to support John's pen training... <laughs> Donate a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars a month to our Patreon, and I swear maybe we'll even send you a gift of a live on four legs pen. Ooh, could use a nice pen. Actually, I could yeah. too. Yeah. This ended up much more valuable of a conversation than I thought it would. And that will get us into the actual encore and back to the rock. Is going to be fun for the next couple songs. Ed is conversing with the crowd, says there's a license plate from Michigan, and the crowd boos a little bit. And then it's like, well, actually, she's kind of pretty, so you may get lucky if you say something nice. I don't know what was going on there. Were you close to this? It sounded like he's no. like, oh, did you make that in prison? No, like I said, it was way up front, so everything was happening behind me. It's like, oh, what? Who knows? No. Okay, yeah, and then he's going through the Cub score, and he's getting the Cub score, and that'll come back a little later, and it is interesting because it is a piece of history. It's not just a random game, and he said it was a 16 to nothing game, and that'll come back a little later as to what actually happened in there. Now, we're going to talk about birthdays, so he wants to get a favor from the crowd. He said, we're going to be the ones that do some more favors for you as the night goes on, but I want to get one for myself. There will be more shared equity in trade, but today is the birthday of a woman that I really, really love. And that's my mom. And it's Glenn Hansard's birthday as well. I'll get her the tape because she's on the West coast. So she'll get it before the night ends. So I don't look like such an asshole son. Can I get your help? Can you sing this one for Karen Vetter? And they all oblige, saying happy birthday. And then at the end, Ed keeps saying, Mom, to you, Mom. It's a fun birthday moment. Happy birthday to Karen. And says, I'm going to try one real quick. He's on the stage all by himself. And then we'll keep moving. For the one and only time at a legitimate Pearl Jam show, not Eddie Vedder solo, we get the ukulele into the wild song, Rise. Such is the way of the world you can never know. Just where to put all your faith, how will it grow? Gonna rise up, burning black holes in dark memories. Gonna rise up.
when this pops up right here, this has to be a complete surprise because there's not even any hints that he would ever do an Into the Wild song, ever. Like, setting forth happened and had its, its moment, and then later this year, I think they would do Society a couple times. They definitely did it in Fenway. I think they did it in Telluride as well. But Rise had never, ever, ever made a Pearl Jam set, and he decided to do it right here. Maybe, is it his mom's favorite song that he wrote? Could be. Oh, yeah, I remember audible gasps and screaming when this started. And I mean, just like I said, like never would have even thought there was a chance. But again, you're thinking like, oh, this is something really cool that we're getting right now. This is something unexpected and and cool that you may never get again. And you haven't. O-T-O-T-O, as they say. But yeah, just an awesome moment here. Getting something like Rise is just crazy. I can't imagine this ever happens again. Probably not. No. Yeah, special for the moment. What I noticed is that, of course, all the Into the Wild songs are like, what, like less than two minutes long? Really, really short. So Pretty close, yeah. They can use that for the soundtrack. I believe he's talked about that before. So the whole song could be played in the movie without getting cut. This was like three or four minutes long. He extended this and kind of went off on it a little bit. And I thought that, that, that was kind of cool. I don't know if he does that in his solo shows. You've seen him solo a couple of times. But Once, yeah. Did it feel like that version was extended at all? I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay. Well, it's good that he did it this way because, again, it's looking like never is probably the destination for that one. So Now, Ed mentions a little story here that his mom hocked her wedding ring so that she can buy him his first guitar. And he paid her back on minimum wage. That was about $2.50 back then. And it was quite a sacrifice. So he says, thank you, Mom. He says, working in a drugstore in San Diego, it's not as good as it sounds, and you didn't get any free drugs. There's a line in this next song about wearing a clip-on tie that I used to wear as a clerk. And then he does all the mimics like, Edward, come down, (laughs) spill an aisle six, take the carts, take the carts, and he mimics all that. It's funny because I mentioned the infallible story before. The next show that we do next week, that Brooklyn show, is going to have essentially a very, very similar story like this sleight of hand where he's telling the story of this is about a guy that worked a dead-end job with a clip-on tie. Lots of interesting tie-ins. Now, this section overall, sleight of hand, footsteps, all those yesterdays, you want to extend Brooklyn a little bit, and it's just on my mind just because we are doing it next week. I don't think I would mention it if... This was something that wasn't on our radar very soon, but footsteps and all those yesterdays on night two were also in the encore around this spot. So maybe he was peeking at the set list from back then and he's like, okay, we'll look at what to do. And yeah, these songs kind of work here or just kind of coincidental happenstance, which is probably the answer for this. He talks about the line in sleight of hand is clip on world. And he talks about it and explains, oh, that was me, you know, this is kind of the beginning of that like hey let's explain stuff which is weird to hear from them especially a a binaural song like two binaural songs in one show like just seemed crazy at the time preparing for that toronto show that's right that's right but i mean these were all debuts for me obviously rise is debut for everyone but sleight of hand footsteps and all those yesterdays i had never seen before so this is all fantastic for me but yeah sleight of hand i thought was just great and they're seated for this as well which is kind of a, a little preview of what we've got in the last couple of years as well they come out with the chairs but i i love this section here i mean debuts yes but uh, great performances too yeah i didn't hear one of those piercing mic solo versions of sleight of hand and i think again if you're sitting in the seats that you're not necessarily going to get that but yeah it's a nice version it's kind of solemn in its way and kind of finds its way there and Sleight of Hand's a very, very good song as it is, and a nice one to see live. It's not going to be a sing-along song, but it's appropriate for this moment. And then before getting into Footsteps, that 16 nothing game that he mentioned before says that, well, breaking news, Jake Arrieta threw a no-hitter. And that gets some reactions of like, oh, oh and then like, uh, okay, who cares? Right. He says, I, I know a lot of you don't give a fuck, but I'm excited. 
And the next time I, I hear a, anything, I don't give a fuck that you give a fuck. And the next time I hear anything about the Gamecocks, I'll get all excited. I'll jump around. Did you care about the Jake Ariana no hitter? No, I did not. I didn't think so. Footsteps and all those yesterdays, the performances I thought for both of them were pretty good, very good. A little jangly and plucky on Stowe's side for footsteps. And then all those yesterdays has a little bit of a plotting rhythm to it. And they hadn't played in two years. A lot of these songs going back to 2014 that they hadn't played mm-hmm. it at. Yeah, footsteps I thought was cool. And like we kind of complained about the harmonic and all. I prefer the pre harmonica versions, but. I think it went over really well here. And I think this is another one that has a little bit of the kind of mournful tone in it. And you can tell that they were definitely thinking about Prince on this. Yeah, you were able to see that. Oh, uh, Corduroy got some following up on that. It, it was four songs, like four songs of more of the mid tempo ish range. And Corduroy has to bring you up, bring you back out of your seats and bring you down the chairs. Oh, yeah. And this was a pretty thunderous version for sure. Again, another one that just refuses to end here. It sounds like they absolutely pack a punch into it. And it's red hot. Matt's fills are insane. Mike is really riffy on the solo. And it is excellent. Cameron, I thought again, would stand out. And another one where Ed is testing with the call and response, like, all right, how, how much you got? What you got left? And you get, oh, you got it. And there's, which, which always feels good. So definitely trying to uh, do it, do, doing our best to keep up with the moment. But yeah, love quarter right here. say that got some was kind of thunderous in a way like cameron taking what he did from corduroy and kind of instilling it a little bit into got some outside of that pretty normal version of got some but i think that cameron put a little extra weight on it whoa whoa whoa! i'm i'm sorry did you what? just have something positive to say about got some in the encore i, I do some presses stop the i presses. do sometimes see i don't care because i wasn't at this show <laughs> Sure. Was at the sure. show, and I didn't see it in three encores previous to the show. <laughs> so doesn't yeah, it's it's a fast one. Gets in, and gets out. Yeah. All right. This is going to be the wasted reprise bed, and Ed is going to tackle the situation from Raleigh. Boom is like changing up the key of this, which I don't think I've ever heard him do before. And this is five minutes here. That's a lengthy reprise for sure. But Ed, kind of at first, is figuring out what to say. Can't really get it out. But now starts talking about the Raleigh situation. Says, that was really tough. If you're bummed out at us, the decision, it was something that we had to do and wasn't taken lightly. If you question the timing, we were trying to do everything to still play. And then he talks about there was a law in South Carolina that is essentially the same thing. Nobody's shocked there. A lot of other states have done this and followed suit. But he says, sometimes it takes a certain amount of sacrifice to take care of other people and their rights when they're being left out there on your own. It could happen to you and me, and we need to protect each other like we're doing here tonight. They do the reprise finish, and then into Wasted, then into Porch. And Boom even changes the key a little bit while Ed's singing over that. That was interesting. I've never heard him do that on that before. He was getting ready to bolt if the crowd had turned on him. There was some mixed reaction from this. 
I remember I, I went back and read and I don't remember seeing this, but evidently there was some people up and behind that had a very like kind of mean spirited sign about it. I don't, it didn't say what it said, but they were holding up a sign to the extent of like, eh, you should have, you should have played. We're, we're not real happy. I don't remember. I, I didn't boo, but I didn't cheer either. I was just kind of way watching and, and seeing what was happening. But yeah, I mean, people are upset. I mean, because this has not been a band historically that has backed down from the spotlight and from a challenge. And I think to some people, it felt like they kind of took the easy way out. Like you should have gone and played, like I said, and stirred some shit and like made them take, take notice of you. Say what you have to say. That seems like that's always been their MO. And again, like doing everything we could do to play, like what does that mean? What, what were you doing? I don't know if that maybe didn't feel right, but it is what it is. They took a stand, and I mean, it, it, they do kind of turn around when he turns to like, oh, it could happen to you, it could happen to me, we need to take care of each other, that he finally gets everyone to kind of be like, oh, okay, yeah, we, we're, we're with you, we're with you, we get it. So he, he kind of ends it and gets everybody back on his side a little bit. What's well, life wasted and porch it up. Ed had a lot of misses in life wasted here, again, it's just something to bring up. It happens a couple times at the show, but whatever. It's not a big deal. Musically, it sounds pretty good. Yeah, Life Wasted is one that doesn't stick out to me from this night. And there's not a full video, so I can't go back and watch the whole thing. But yeah, I don't remember this one sticking out to me. The one in St. Louis, that's the one that sticks out to me for sure. This one didn't resonate for whatever reason. Now, Porch is interesting because this is going to be a long, long version of Porch. It's going to last nine and a half minutes. And it's going to be another one where it's that never ending, ending yet again. Yeah, this is a fantastic version of Porch. Cameron, I think, is again the highlight. Just putting on a clinic during that jam, I thought it was fantastic. And then both Mike and Ed go down to the rail and hang out a little bit, which is always fun when you're up that close to see them kind of like, super up close and personal gets gets a big crowd response but yeah another one the ending too just you know again feels like you're watching the who in 1965 oh yeah <laughs> it's, again mention it a couple of times like that is the big big takeaway from this show is that they just don't want to finish and it is a pleasant pleasant appearance <laughs> Encore 2. Ed's getting a little bit of the lay of the land. Shouts out the VIP section in the back, watching Cameron behind the stage. And he comments on Jeff's shirt. It's a common one that he's worn that reads, Unfuck the World. And Jeff talks for a second and mentions the woman that he got it from. And it doesn't sound like he wants to be on mic that much. He's just like, Yeah, I got it from her over there. She's in a band. And then just walks away. <laughs> but after that, out of nowhere, we get this little jam, and you can hear Ed say, we're thinking about Andy, 
And it felt like the jam kind of came out of nowhere. He's like, he thought he was going to talk more and he thought he was going to go into this thing. And I can't put my finger on what this jam is, but I think you had put on the concertpedia that this was like a purple rain tease. And I yeah. wasn't, is it really? Yeah. It's purple rain. I didn't hear that in that. Hmm. Yeah. It starts, I think while he's talking, like Mike goes over to Matt and they kind of like look at each other and do a little thing. And Mike kind of starts it and Matt kind of goes into it and they kick into it. Like it's like 30 seconds maybe, but yeah, it's, it's not like the recognizable part of Purple Rain because it's the Purple Rain. You remember that that guitar intro, right? That sets the whole thing up. But it's more of just they're just jamming on the, I think, the ending of Purple Rain. But yeah, it's a little Prince tribute there. Chloe Crown is going to be in the next song, and as Ed is saying, yeah, we're thinking about Andy. I wonder, it has to have a tie into Prince that he's thinking, you know, from one front man that could have had this big time career as a big time rock star that lost it before he even had it to a guy that lived being a rock star. And I wonder if losing somebody, and he always talks about it, he's always talking, you know, just thinking about Andy, just thinking about Andy. And I think next week's show again another tie into brooklyn he'll say that about chloe dancer crown of thorns in there that he's thinking about andy earlier that day so before we get into much more on chloe crown this is going to be another one that we want to talk to javier on because weirdly enough we've never talked about this song for javier he's never broke it down so why not do it right now And I won't forget Time spent laying by her side Time spent laying by her side Dreams like this must die In a dream All right, guys, this one is going to be a little different. So in Crown of Thorns, historically, we have seen both players play Les Pauls all over the place. Since they decided to adopt this song and to make it their own, that's what they have been using historically. Now, Les Pauls have a little bit of history, which is a little interesting. So PAF is a term that it means patent applied for. So Basically, this kind of pickup that Gibson started to use in the 50s, it was a musical response to whatever the other brand known as Fender was doing. Single pickups or single coil pickups, they're going to be running in a 60 cycle hum. That's how you're going to get that clarity, but also they're very, very noisy. If you are a guitar player and you have a Fender Strat, you know what I'm talking about. But in 1955, Gibson decided to take a new take, a new path, and they wanted to do something different. They just wanted to have a pickup that it was not going to be a single pickup 60 cycle hum, but not a P90 either. So 
a really, really well-known designer called Seth Lover started to design this pickup, which is basically trying to eliminate the sound or eliminate the hum out of the pickup. Hum booker, hum pickup, hum bugging. That's where the name humbugger starts for. Now, like we were saying before, PAF stands for Pattern Apply For, but this is the iconic story about this iconic sound and pickup. They started to be out in 1958. Those were the first years that the Les Pauls started to include this. But the interesting thing about this, there's a lot of people that they think this kind of pickup, it's super hot and it will drive amps and it's kind of like for more like a power rock or stuff like that. But actually PAFs are considerably warmer, thicker and chewer. They have more chew, they have more beef, whatever you want to call it. But the single coil has a little bit more clarity to it. But then players have started to figure it out that clearing out volume, rolling down, volume down, treble bleed systems, any other sort of custom thing that you can add up to the guitar could add a little bit more clarity to it, but you will have that bite. Now, sound-wise, they're very, very, very well known to have super high mids in that bite. That high mid with a bite is something that you can connect and you can only obtain through a Marshall amp. Like, that's the classic combo that you can always get. I know this is a little different, but it's something that I wanted to explain and talk to you guys because this sound has become a staple of the song. And there's delay pedal here and there when they're playing the song with the solo, but I thought that it would be a really cool explanation for you guys to know why this song has the sound and why the guitars pick for that sound have the sound that they have, if that makes sense. So, yep, that's all for this week. All right. Javier, you will be back next week in a much larger capacity. Can't wait for that. John, this is a pretty emotional version. This has a good punch to it, and it has an emotional ending to it. What's all going on up there? What did you see? When I think of the Pearl Jam shows that I've been to and like what moments stick out to me, it's obviously like Easty Girls from Atlanta 98, Stone showing his tits from Charlotte 2013. And then, I mean, that's going to be on there, of course. And then it's this version of Chloe Dance or Crown of Thorns because, I mean, just pulling at your heartstrings. I mean, you guys know if you've seen this song, it's unbelievably emotional and cathartic to see live. This is the first time I'd seen it. But what I remember is after the song, like after the song kind of winds down and has that kind of quiet ending, Ed kind of like puts his head down and he goes over to Stone and he gives him a hug. And you can tell it's like it's sincere, like it's not performative. And then he goes over to Jeff and like says something in his ear and like gives him a hug. And I'm thinking, I'm like, we're 26 years into this band. He doesn't have to do that anymore. Like they know how he feels about it. But just the fact that he cares enough to go have a little moment with them after the song that they wrote with Andy to be like, Hey, this still means a lot to me. Like, I'm, who knows what he said? It really, like, it got to me at the time. Like, I remember just like, oh man, like, I'm gonna start crying just to watch him do that. I don't, I don't know how many people even saw it because, you know, Mike is doing his thing over there. But it's just these little intangible things that just make the show for you. This is the main thing that I think about when I think about the show is just him going over them and taking the time to be like, hey, thank you. Hey, thinking about you. Hey, that was that was great. You know, giving them a little moment. For that song it was really really special this song whenever it does come up it is very rare to get a version of this where something isn't going on that doesn't make it powerful that doesn't make it emotional that some things aren't stirring in their mind you mentioned a lot that they like to play it in places where stages where andy would have liked to play at madison square garden type places wrigley those kind of places it's been played before and it just brings so much weight to the show because everybody who's there understands how important it is and i'm sure you weren't the only one that caught that i'm sure there were people Mm -hmm. that 
were probably tearing up as it was because it does cause that. You think about just the history with it, and we could be sitting here right now and doing a Mother Love Bone podcast if, if you know all things <laughs> right. turned out, or a bad radio podcast, who the hell knows? But it is one of Pearl Jam's most important songs. And I, I, yeah, it's not one of their songs. It's covering something that the writers in the band had written, but it's one of the most important songs that they can play on any single set. The rest of this show, 10 era songs. How about State of Love and Trust and Black? We get a great moment of State of Love and Trust. The mic gets thrown over to the crowd and they do some of the hey oh hey How close were you to that? Not at all. It was the, I think it was over on Mike's side. So I was, unfortunately, I was not involved. Next time you got to try better. You got to just like reach mm-hmm. for the yeah, microphone yeah. all yeah, the way, all the way. Work on that wingspan in spring training mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with the pen and, you know, bring a pen to the next show and just be like, I can reach that. I can reach it. I can get there. Right. Hey, I've, I've had my moment. Ed's pointed at me and given me a pick personally. So I've had my moment. Now, of course, we're in black territory right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> do your thing. I mean, call me a broken record if you want to. I mean, another eight minute incredible version, I think, as it starts off, he goes, let's hear the choir. You know, and that always feels good to be like, OK, he knows we're putting in our two cents here, holding the bar end. But good Lord, Mike McCready on this. Another one that's just mournful. I mean, you can hear him just putting all of his emotion in that solo. It's unbelievable. Even I think Stone goes over and walks over to the other side, which almost never does, and plays with Jeff a little bit during the solo. Like, they kind of play off each other and do a little thing. But this improv, too, I mean, I don't, I don't think, I can't remember. We haven't talked about this in forever. Time Heals? That, yeah, the Time Heals improv, which he's done a few times. Is I don't think it's an improv. Bit. I think this is a Todd Rundgren song. Is it, yeah, the tag? Yeah. Um, the Time Heals tag. We almost never get to talk about it. It's only done it a few times, but yeah, love it. Absolutely amazing. on that perfect just come down with the crowd singing along and doing the doo-doos and it was exceptional the time heals tag excellent like you said it doesn't come up very often but it's a little bit of a change of pace from the we belong together but still kind of it fits right in that realm it still fits right in that realm as like the the sequel to that party time it's the bread and butter, alive, rocking in the free world, Yella Ledbetter. This is going to be your last show until going to those Wrigley shows that year, mm-hmm. so this yeah. is like your last time to really, really party with this. Oh, yeah, especially after that black, everyone just wanted that catharsis, and you need like to finish with that joy that like seemed like it was kind of missing for good reason, like not for anything that the band did. But that you needed this kind of celebration at the end of the night to be like, hey, we're still alive, even though it's been a rough day, it's been a rough couple of days for the band, we're still alive, can still pull us off. And they, yeah, full celebration mode here was, was well deserved. Rockin' in the Free World has yet again, this is going to be our last one of the night, another refusal to end the fucking song.
Ledbetter is probably the most important of the three. And before they get into Ledbetter, Ed does shout out a young girl that's on her father's shoulders. And he said, I can't throw this, meaning a tambourine, because it's kind of sharp. I don't want to hurt her. But they pass a tambourine back to her, which is, of course, always a very, very sweet moment. But yeah, Ledbetter has its ups and it has its downs. It gets a little tossed up during the mid-verse solo where you kind of were telling me before we started recording that people kind of had some complaints with this. Yeah, there's like, I think Mike just completely forgets that he's supposed to do a solo here because he's just hamming up with Jeff and pointing at people and talking and like, I think Ed and Stone kind of look over him like, you good? Everything? Everything all right over there? And they kind of like laugh it off like, oh, he's like, he kind of holds up his hand like, oh, my bad, my bad. And goes into it. But yeah, you can hear him just completely miss his cue to come in on the solo there. And yes, some people went back and looked and like people were like, hey, maybe worry less about hamming it up with the with the crowd and, and pointing at people and maybe work on playing your solos in time. But again, you're in the moment. He's having fun. It's the end of the night. Like, what are you going to do? And here's what I don't understand. Why focus on that when he fucking tags it with Purple Rain? Right. Come on, you guys. Really, do you just have to utilize some negative energy because it's there? Like, can't the positive energy just uh, just beat it to the finish line? It's a perfect ending for this show. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's very sweet, and it has the whole entire crowd clapping along. Were the purple paperback, or... Was... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I just, yeah... I can't believe people sometimes, but it's not like I've never been negative, but I'm just saying like you can leave one thing out and focus on the good and really the bow of this great show. South Carolina stole our hearts and yep. The crowd clapping along is the way that you get to finish up Columbia, South Carolina, 2016. All right. We are at that point to give three stars to our favorite songs and performances from the night. Number three is Chloe dancer and crown of thorns. Number two is I got id shit. And number one is, is immortality. Oh, I just want to pick seven. There's so much from here. Oh, honorable mention to immortality. Um, Ooh. I know, I know. But I'm going to go with the heart more than the ears. My number three is lightning bolt. My number two is rise. And my number one is Chloe Dancer, Crown of Thorns. Yeah, you really can't go wrong on any of those picks for sure. Yeah. All right, rating time. Uh, Obviously, outside looking in here, this is kind of the first time I've had experience with this show. Not a bad show at all. Obviously, there were some things. It was sloppy in places, and Ed wasn't pristine. Those are things that you can look at and be like, can you let it affect you? Yeah, but honestly, I'm going to choose to take the themes of the night, which were incorporated perfectly of Raleigh situation and Prince, and use that to kind of guide my rating towards more of a positive light and those songs that just did not want to end 
is going to be what I take away from this show. So I am going to give this one an eight. All right. Last week, I think I was a little, tried to be fair and honest. I didn't go with a heart on that one because I, last week I show I gave it that I gave it a seven. This week I can't do that. This is a perfect 10 for me. Great, great set list. Great moments all up and down. I, I love the set list top to bottom. Tons of stuff I'd never heard before. Tons of great moments. No TOTO. Everything you wanted. I look back on this very, very fondly. I give it a 10. This is one of those shows where you always say something is a 10 for somebody. Yep. There you yep. go. I think that probably is a, a good example of that. So, all right. Well, I kind of told you guys what we we're doing next week. And since our seventh episode that we ever did was Brooklyn Night 2 from 2013, we're going to do Brooklyn Night 1 from 2013 to kick off my personal story section and do that. And then the next week, we'll pay a little tribute to a venue that we're going to be seeing Pearl Jam in this year. So if you're ready for that next week, Brooklyn Night 1, 2013. If you're not subscribed, please, that's the easiest thing you can do. Go and subscribe. Hit the subscribe button on Apple or Spotify, and you get the notifications whenever this podcast has a brand new episode, which last week we had three in a row. It was a big, 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 big week. So hopefully you guys got to intake all of that. And if you want to help out even further than that, you can rate this podcast on both of those platforms. We would love a five-star rating because that helps our visibility out. And that pushes us, of course, to the top of the Pearl Jam podcasting world, which we feel like we're near the top and are the top of no matter what. But also on Apple, the thing that you can do the most to help us is tell everybody what you think about the show and how we're doing and it will go to the next person that wants to listen to a Pearl Jam podcast that's like whoa what's this about they cover shows I've been to shows I want to hear a show that they cover that I went to all you gotta do is just tell them hey this is what they do and this is how I've enjoyed this show and maybe the next person's gonna pick it up and say I would like to try and enjoy the show as well. And then they tell another person, they tell another person, and the community comes full circle. That's all you need to do to help us out. If you'd like to contribute, Patreon is there, but that is also another very, very, very easy way that you can help push us forward as well. This may be the end. We're here, but not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, miss you already, miss you always. Is Brooklyn in the house? I thought so. For next week, see you on the pod. RIP Prince.